And uh, a psalm that probably many wouldn't think of as a psalm, but uh, the Bible calls it a song over in Numbers 21. And uh, we're going to look through uh, most of the chapter here. It's going to be verses 1 through 20. Uh, but all of that is to really bring into context exactly what is communicated into the song. And uh, sometimes we, we just get to a song, we're like, oh, it's only a few, only a couple verses. It really just means nothing. Well, you got to realize the whole backstory before you can really grab hold of the message. So uh, it says in verse 1, And when the king Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell, sounds like a southern expression, right? The herd tell. Herd tell that Israel came by the way of the spies and they fought against Israel and he took some of them prisoners. So there's a defeat we see in verse 1, verse 2. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people and in my hand I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel, delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. It's interesting, we'll go back to this in just a little while, but uh, you find that name again back in Numbers chapter 14 uh, where the 12 spies went out. But uh, verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to com compass the land of Edom. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Again, here's another defeat, a, a time of discouragement. Now they sinned against his, uh, God, and He sends these fiery serpents. There's a judgment. And uh, verse 7, there's going to be a solution that we find here. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, and we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it came to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And the children of Israel set forth and pitched in Obeth. Let's jump down to verse 16. Um, <clears throat> verse 16 says, And from thence they went to Beer, uh, that is the well thereof. Beer is a word that means well. Uh, it says, It's a well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, Gather the people together, and I'll give them water. There's a promise that's there. It says, Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, singing unto it. The princes digged the well, and the nobles of the prince, uh, people digged, digged it by the direction of the lawgiver, and their staves from the wilderness they went to Matana, and from Matana to Nahaliel, to Nahaliel to Bamoth, and from Bamoth in the valley in the country of Moab to the top of Pisgah, which looketh toward Jeshimon. And Israel, uh, oh, verse 20 is where I'm stopping, okay, all right. Well, let's stop there. And again, let me just uh, say another prayer and then we'll get into the lesson. Lord, help me to communicate this message as you've given it to me. And Lord, I know it's a long passage. But Lord, help us to wrap our minds around it. I believe that there's an important lesson here. And uh, Lord, may we learn to sing as Israel had learned to sing once again. After discouragement, after failure after temptations, and, and, and Lord, where they could do nothing more than hang their head low. And yet they see that there is still faith, there is still hope, there is still encouragement to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may you teach us to sing as Israel had to learn to sing once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, when I think of this, this uh, passage of Scripture, you know, you think of wells and the digging that's involved there. They didn't have the technology that you and I have today. And of course, we could send out a truck and they would have these great big booms on there, a big auger, and they could just drill down into the ground. For them, they had to physically dig. And it reminds me of the old farm days when I had to go out and didn't have a tractor, didn't have any uh, backhoes or anything else like that. When it came to digging the fence posts, it was all by hand. And that's where I learned to get blisters and the value of hard work. And 
sometimes when it comes to that, and uh, even a psalm doesn't really seem fit to help you and to encourage you during those times, you know. Uh, you're little, you remember the seven doors, uh, was it uh, Snow White and the Seven Doors, and is it, you know, they sing those songs, Whistle While You Work, and you hear these songs, uh, I've been working on the railroad all the live long day, and it doesn't matter how much you sing those songs, it doesn't really seem to encourage you. Uh, and uh, I don't believe that that's the, really the lesson behind the song at all. I, you know, they, they are singing before they even get the well waters out, but they're singing because of, uh, of their faith in Christ and faith in God and what uh, they, they've learned to value God's grace uh, that was bestowed upon them. And I believe that's really the lesson that comes out of this. And uh, sometimes it's, it's that that we got to rely upon. Um, Again, we might have heard songs like this. I've looked this one up because I wouldn't have got the words right. It's been a long time since I've heard these words, okay? Uh, but the Battle of New Orleans. How many of you remember that song from way back when? Yeah? It says, in 1814, we took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson down the mighty Mississippi. We took a little bacon, we took a little beans, and we caught the bloody, bloody British in the town of New Orleans, right? And, uh, you know, it was important. They sing this song, and it, it just rises that patriotism. I was telling my wife, she says, why are you listening to that song? I was listening to it last night. I said, I'm preparing to use it for a sermon illustration in the morning. She said, that's just like the Americans. Anytime something good happens, we win a, a, a victory. We begin to sing songs. She says, when we lose, you don't hear a peep. Uh, but anyway, this battle was important, and for many, uh, in years gone by, you know, Jackson, you might have heard about it in a history lesson or something. But sometimes we, we, we forget to value those events that happened way back when. Now, I know it's a, a little spin on the words. I know that the guy that penned the words uh, penned it back in, I guess, the 1950s or something like that. Like it, way over 100 years before or way after the battle even took place. But it was the last battle between the Americans and the British. And I mean, we, we finally had this uh, complete uh, breakaway, this complete, so no more battles, no more uh, problems from the British after that. And um, along with the, all the European ideas that go along with that, uh, the aristocracy, aristocracy and the entitlement. And uh, so anyway, I, I bring out of that all of this for this reason. Again, I believe that this singing up, spring up, oh well, spring up, oh well, was something that inspired faith within them. I mean, when you're fighting battles, you want something to believe in. You want something to, to be encouraged by. You, you want to believe that America's still good. You want to believe uh, there's still good people that want to fight for our country. It's not just all lost, right? It's that kind of thing. They, they are believing in God once again. And it's just this strong faith that you see within them as they begin to sing unto the Lord. Our spiritual journey uh, sometimes involves uh, uh, just all kinds of different experiences. Like, you know, it's, I've been saved for many, many years now. And it just seems like yesterday. And I tell you this, I, it seems like you have these spiritual victories... And sometimes you can live on those spiritual victories, but those spiritual victories only live for so long. The next thing you know, you're back down in the valley once again. The next thing you know, you just, uh, you're like, where did I go wrong? What happened? How did I get here? And then you'll have another victory. And then you, know, you, you rise in that victory, and then it's back down in the valley once again. And there's rise and, and lows and rise and lows. All this to remind us of this one valuable lesson that I believe is, you know, we got to have this constant dependency upon the Lord God Almighty. It can't be just you, you only rely upon Him to get that one victory. It's got to be this continual resting in God's grace, resting in God's power, resting in God's presence. And uh, it's for, because of that that I want to put this song in perspective for you. Um, again, right before the song were trials and failures of all kinds. And so if we would set the scene for you again in verse 13... We look back up and we see that this, uh, uh, just this traveling that they're going through, they're on the other side of the river of, of Arnon. And I believe it's the river. They're, they're very close to entering into the promised land. Arnon it was a very important word for, for us to realize here. The Arnon River, it empties into the Dead Sea. And of course the Dead Sea doesn't you know, have anywhere to let the water out of. But anyway... They, they are to the point where they're so close to the promised land. Again, I say 
they're, they're to the point where uh, uh, bring, bring us back over to Numbers chapter 14 where they sent the 12 spies and it says they, uh, they, they tried to go out after they failed to believe them. The 10 spies brought discouragement into the land and they came back, they told the people they were discouraged and, and they were rebuked because of that. They thought that they could go, go in and uh, through their own power and win that victory. But no, that victory, they, were, they, they ended up being defeated. If we look at Numbers chapter 14 verse 30, what is it? Uh, 35, I think it is. Um, no, it's even further down. That's because I'm in the wrong chapter. There we go. Let's see. Um, let me, let me, verse 44. They presumed to go up to the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Verse 45. And the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in the hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even into Hormah. There's our word. So they're, they're so close. I mean, before, when they first come in, they receive the, they, they cross the Red Sea, they sing the song of Moses, they, they, they receive the law at Mount Sinai. God gives them the promise. They, they are able to go into the promised land, but yet because of their unbelief, they're not able to go. Now they're back to the point where they started years and years ago. 38 years later, they're finally there. Like we're so close to the promised land that we can taste it. And this is, this is what I want you to understand. So there's this change. They're able to come back in and once again so close to this promised land. There's a change going on in Israel's history. They're doing something. Now all of a sudden where they've been wandering through the wilderness, it turns into battles. Yeah, they had a battle in, uh, what is it, Exodus chapter 15, maybe against the Amalekites. Yeah, they did have a battle there. But there wasn't much battling going on for that many of those years wandering through the wilderness. There might have been one or two, but now all of a sudden we look in verse 1 of chapter 21, there's a battle. And they're going to face some more battles that are going on. And then they're going to have to, they're going to, have to trust God. They're going to, have to rely upon His power. They're going to, have to rely upon His strength. They're going to have to listen to His direction. They're going to face Sihon, the king of, uh, the, king of the Amorites. We're going to see that later on in this chapter. They're going to have to face Bashan, the uh, uh, or, or, king, king of Og, or King Og, the king of Bashan. In the same chapter, we're going to face the next chapter, chapter 22, where the king of Moab, they hire out Balaam to go curse the children of Israel. All of this is in their future yet. And uh, so it's going to be difficulty. They dig this well, whereas before God had uh, cured the waters of Mariba, this is going to be something entirely different. Before God, they come to the, the, the water, they begin to murmur, complain, and God tells them to cast a tree into the water, the bitter waters are healed. Before Moses would go and strike the rock and water would come out of the rock, before it would tell them, even the previous chapter, Numbers chapter 20, is when God told Moses to go and speak to the rock, and guess what he did? Struck the rock. And of course, Aaron would die because of the rebellion. Moses wouldn't be able to enter into the promised land because of it. There was another failure that was there, but God gave water out of the rock. This is completely different. They're going back, they're into a cultivated land where they want to dig to get this water. But God promised that they would give it to them. Um, <clears throat> it would require work. Israel is encamped at this place, and the book of the wars of the Lord is brought up right before this. Again, like the battle of New Orleans. These are the wars of the Lord, ones which He has won, which God had given them the victory, whether it was the crossing of the Red Sea, or whether it was the battle of Amalek, Exodus 15, or whether it was uh, all the way up to this point where He gave them victory over King Arad, the Canaanite. And uh, so there is, there is victory right there. And at this campsite, God said that He was going to give them water. At this campsite. And what they do, uh, they, they, they begin to sing. Before, what was the character of, uh, of Israel like as they wandered through the wilderness? What, was the, what, was, what were they known to do? Complain? Murmur? I mean, just doubt God, be discouraging, that kind of thing. That's what they were known to do. They weren't known for singing a whole lot. I mean, the only time that we find them singing, they're singing to God. Exodus chapter, uh, was it 14, when they crossed to the Red Sea? 
We looked at that last week. That's really the first psalm that they sing and praise unto God, honoring Him. That was their, 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 their natal psalm. That was their uh, uh, independent song. But after that, we don't find them singing. The only time that we find them singing, we find them singing when uh, Moses is up on the mount. You now follow me. Forty days, forty nights. And God says, uh, the children of Israel rebel, get down from this mountain. He breaks the Ten Commandments. But he says, uh, Joshua says, I hear the noise of war. He says, no, that's not war, that's singing. And they were singing to false gods. Now they are singing once again. So there's something particular about this. So there's a change in attitude, even from verse 4 in this same chapter. The wells were important in Israel's day. We find scripture, uh, Beersheba. Uh, that was a well that Abraham had dug, and then there was striving. And uh, Abraham makes a, uh, an accord with Abimelech. There's uh, the well of Bethlehem that David longs for, and they get water out of the well of Bethlehem. Jacob's well in Samaria. This, this well is going to be equally as, as important. Oh boy. Sometimes our um, times of frustration and deprivation are met with abundant blessing and provision from the Lord. And we need to turn away from grumbling and complaining. We need to repent. And when we've sinned, we need to look for Lord in faith. Uh, here's another quote here. It says, uh, this reminds us that whenever God takes you down a long, difficult journey, there's refreshment at the end, there's victory, there's peace for those who repent. Sometimes the road could be 40 years long, and sometimes it could take 40 years till you learn your lesson. I don't know what happened, but I lost all my notes from, from last night. But anyway, that's okay. Um, again, we see, we see all kinds of spiritual lessons that are coming out of this. And uh, there, there, there's a lot that they have to learn, a lot that they have to put in perspective. I believe that this is when, you know, God had told them, He says, now the, the generation that have forgotten me, they are going to perish in the wilderness. It's going to be the children to go into the promised land, and they're, they're going to learn from the lessons that their fathers had, had failed in. And so when they go up, and we see in verse 1 where the king Arad, the Canaanite, uh, th this is important, it's going to be the first battle against Canaan. This is preparing before they even reach Jericho, before they even go into the promised land. And they're going to have to learn that they want to live by faith because of this. And of course, they, they, they go into, they take some of, some of them in prisoner. It seems like they tried one time and then they lost some men because of that. But in verse 2, we see something entirely different. They learned that they, okay, if we were to do anything, we would to need God's help in this. And so they vow a vow unto the Lord and said, hey, if you want to give us a victory, if you deliver us... If you deliver them into our hands, then we're going to go up and we're going to just wipe out the entire place. And this is what they do. In fact, you know, this is what we find. This is God's instruction all through as they deal with the land of Canaan. He tells them to go in. He says, I want you to wipe out anything and everything. And Jericho is a little bit of an exception because of Rahab's faith. And, and Rahab and her family was spared because of that. But anyway... This would be an entirely different approach than they've ever approached before. Just like Joshua won the victory in Exodus 15, they want to trust the Lord to go in and take this victory. And so now there's, there's this new reliance. So it says in verse 3, Now they have the Lord's presence. It says that the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel. Again, before, Numbers 14, they went up presumptuously. Now they have the Lord's help. Verse 3, they hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities, and they called the name of the place Hormah. So they've learned a lesson, didn't they? A valuable lesson. And they've learned that they, uh, they need God's help if they're going to win any battles in this life. They should have been... Grateful, they want to learn a lesson on gracious, God's graciousness in this very next section. We we'll look at verses four all the way down to verse uh, ten, and they want to learn how good God has been to them. A lot of times, people pass over God's graciousness, and they, they see, you know, they, 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 they take for granted, you know, uh, God's salvation. They pass over uh, everything that God has done for them. They're not thankful. They're not. To, uh, they're, they're not happy about the, the life. But yet, God's been good to every one of us. Jeremiah says that over the book of Lamentations, His mercies are new every morning. 
And so when we look at verses 4 on down, and of course he says that the way was hard. They, verse uh, 4 says at the end, the last half, it says the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Guess what? Life is hard. And there's times we can get discouraged because the way is hard that God brings us on. But that doesn't mean that God is not faithful. That doesn't mean that God hasn't been good to us. And because the way is hard, guess what? They have formed habits within their lives. They watched their fathers. They formed these very same habits in their life of murmuring and complaining, murmuring and complaining. And it seems like it's always worse as it progresses. So if I just murmur, I'll get my way. They murmured against Moses as it uh, what, what, what did Moses say? Uh, Shall I fetch water out of this rock, you rebels? And he struck it, not knowing that even he was rebellious on his heart. What I'm saying is that they had developed this habit of murmuring and complaining. Habit of murmuring and complaining. You develop that habit, it's going to come back to you so easy. You develop a habit of being angry, just like a priest on Wednesday night. You develop that habit, it's going to be easy to get angry the next time, and the next time after that, and the next time after that. That habit forms into your character, and this murmuring and complaining had gotten into their character, where they would just murmur and complain, murmur and complain. I don't know about you, I, I don't like being around complaining people. I really don't. You know, it's one of those kind of character traits that really is devouring their very own souls. They don't even realize it. The people spake against Moses, verse 5, and says, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt? You find a resentment that's there. We, we can say what we want, but they have resentment. You know people that have resentment in their heart? They resented Moses. They resented the fact that God had brought them out of Egypt. They resented the fact that they had to wander around the wilderness. Whose fault was that? Their fault. There was some resentment that was there. And it says, you've brought us out to die in the wilderness. What does that tell you? They had fear. They had resentment. They're dealing with fear. You just brought us out here because you want to kill us all. Now, that's not the reason. God has sent Moses to deliver them. And they watched God deliver the nation of Israel time and time and time again. The fear was all wrong. It was a false fear. It wasn't a fear that they should have had. But they watched their fathers die in the wilderness. I believe that's where it came from. It says, For there is neither bread, and neither is there any water, and uh, our soul loatheth this light bread. And so you see that there is a, a more to the story. You know, they, they, they're wondering what's next. And they are not satisfied. They are ungrateful for what God has done for them. They are ungrateful for how gracious God has been to them. And their shoes not wearing out. And their clothes not wearing out. Ungrateful for the man. Ungrateful for the rock that sent forth the water out of it. Ungrateful for all of this. And so what does God do? Because they didn't receive God's grace. He sends judgment. And this judgment brings this punishment. The punishment is death. We see it in verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and, the, and, and much people of Israel died. So they cry out to the Lord. They begin to repent. Say, Man, we, this is our fault. We, we did wrong. And they begin to repent. Say, God, you know, uh, well, actually they go to Moses and say, please pray to the Lord for us. Please pray to the Lord for us that God to take away these fiery serpents. I, I find this, the people a lot of times know when they've done wrong. And they'll go to somebody and say, will you pray for me? I think to myself, why don't you pray for yourself? <laughs> it's interesting that uh, when God approaches Job, He says, uh, you know, Job's going to pray for you, you pray for your friend, and your captivity is going to be turned. They go to Moses, have Moses pray for him. When it's over in James, and it says that they've been sick, and uh, you know, they're near unto death, and He says, if there's fault among you, confess one to another, and uh, you know, have the elders come and pray, and uh, you know, put on that uh, oil on them and so forth. And it says the prayer of faith will heal them. But anyway, Moses begins to pray and gives them. He doesn't just take it away. I guess that's kind of what they were expecting. They expected God just to do something miraculous. Guess what he does? He tells Moses, he said, I want you to build a fiery serpent and put it on a pole. You know what that tells me? They had to look their sin right in the face. And people all the time, they're looking, they're sent right in the face. And it, many times it's strange to me that they will not repent. We've got to see our sin for what it really is. 
We got to see the murmuring, the complaining, the resentment, the fear. We got to see all that for what it really is. You can't just go out and say, oh, I repent, and just be like Pharaoh and expect all of it to be fine. You need to look faith, the, the sin in the face and call it out and say, this is sin in my life, and I need a, a true repentance, not something that's just going to be, uh, that, that gets me through the next week, and then all of a sudden I'm back into sin again. There needs to be a true repentance. And they need to rest upon God's grace. It's interesting that uh, you look at all these lessons we get in the Old Testament. Jesus says over in John chapter 6, when it talks about God's graciousness, the manna that came down from heaven, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life that come down from heaven. Not as He gave you fathers in the wilderness, but I'm the bread of life. It tells Him over in a, was it 1 Corinthians chapter, was it 13 I believe it is, where that rock was Christ. We see all these emblems coming out. And then just... Unbelievable to our imaginations, this sign of the serpent on the pole also is a picture of Jesus. Now He takes our judgment for us. And you see these lessons come out of the Bible. And then we move on and we see that now they're going to travel and there's just enemies left and right, left and right. And they're just trying to get on through. They pass through this river or and they come to a place... And they go down to verse 16 now. From thence they came to Beer, that's the well, where the Lord spake unto Moses. Moses, what I want you to do, I want you to bring these people to this place. It's called Beer. This place, there's a well there. And I want you to gather all the people to it. And I want to bring them water. I'll give them water. I'll give them water. Because I'm a gracious God and I'll give it for them that, that, that they may be helped because of this. They're going to need this water so that they may be sustained. They're going to need this water so they can have strength to face these enemies. They're going to need this water because it's not going to, they're not going to stay here at this place at this well. But they're going to need a sufficient supply. Uh, there's going to be more than enough, just like it was with a, with a manna, right? Where he tells me, he says, I want you to go out. Talk about the manna now. I want you to go out and I want you to get uh, enough manna for the day. And on the sixth day, I want you to gather twice as much so that you can prepare it on the seventh day. There's an abundant supply for them. They're, they're, it's not like they're going to lack. Um, there's no good thing that God's going to withhold from, the, from His children. And He gives us abundant supply, a sufficient supply. It's going to be exactly what they need. It's going to be a sure supply. God guarantees that He's going to give it here at this place. And uh, they begin to do something that's completely different than they've ever done before. They begin to sing unto the Lord. And I, I just love that. God promises a supply. And then they begin to sing. The sing brings everybody in unity together. Strange to me, you, sometimes you, 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 you elect people in the office, you, uh, the higher-ups. It doesn't matter if it was back in Nehemiah's day. It doesn't matter if it was back in Jesus' day or in the Romans' day or the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, what have you. It doesn't even matter if it's our day. A lot of times you don't find the nobles or the princes doing the work. But here we find something that's completely different. It's the nobles or the princes who are the ones who are doing the digging. They begin to sing unto the Lord. This song here pictures their faith. God's been so good to us. We believe God can do this. I mean, before you look at the nation of Israel, I'm sure at this point in time, if you would have approached any one of them, they probably would have hung their head down low because they hadn't been faithful to God at all. How's that journey been? been rough. Oh, then you had the same God that got you through the Red Sea. Oh yes, He's been faithful to us. He's been faithful to us, but we've been unfaithful. We haven't been true to our God. We haven't worshipped Him like He wants to be worshipped as He had revealed Himself unto us. He's told us how to worship. He's told us how to behave. He showed us that He can sustain us. He's taken care of us along the way. But we haven't been faithful. That's, that's been our... Can I tell you, that's been my life lesson. God's been more faithful to me than I can ever imagine. 
Now they go from this and they realize God's faithfulness. Why are you singing? Because God's been so good to us. And we just believe that God can. He does, he does want to take care of us as His children. He does love us. He is gracious. He can supply. He is powerful. He is present. He does know what we need before we even ask for it. I noticed that they didn't go to Moses to say, Moses, we're thirsty. Come give us water again out of this rock. No, they're obedient to the command and they just believe that God will and God can. And that, that song, it turns, into, it turns into a prayer and they're praying, God, bring water up out of this well. Spring up, O oh well. It's more than just a song, it's a prayer. Uh, Lord, give us this, this water that you say that you were to give us. Back over in John, this, Jesus deals with a woman at the well of Samaria. It's interesting, some of the things that uh, he says to her that's kind of similar to the, the situation here of, of um, the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness here. Uh, it might take me a while to, to find it. <clears throat> It says in verse 14, well, let's back into verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. God was ready to give water. Something that's satisfying. Something that's, uh, that was going to help him. God is gracious. Plentiful of mercy. Anyway, he turns into a prayer and they're praying unto the Lord and expecting. And when we pray, we need to be, God, what, you know, I'm expecting you to do something. You said if I did this, you wanted us to be here. This is the well. This is where you gathered us. You told Moses, this is the place to dig. And now we're expecting you to give the supply. We need to pray. In that sort of way. Sometimes when it comes to the prayer meeting, Brother Ed, you know, I, I, I love to preach. I really do. And we pray, and I, I, I love the prayer. I wonder sometimes why more people were not there, one. But two, why my prayer life... Let me just point the fingers back at me. Why my prayer life isn't much better than it is. And I look here at the children of Israel and the reason why they sang so fervently and prayed so fervently was because they're thirsty. They're thirsty and they're singing. They're thirsty and they're praying. And I believe that if we're thirsty, if we truly desire something and we pray, God, God will give us exactly what we need, not all our wants. He didn't promise to supply all our wants, but He promised to supply our need. And God knows those needs before we even get there. Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, God knows how to take care of His children. Now, I just believe we need to get thirsty for God once again. So there's this supply that God promises to bring. There's a song that they sing. And the song turns into a prayer. And then that prayer turns into something that they got to act on. They, they, they have to physically dig. When they're saying spring up, spring up, oh well. It's not like they sit back and do nothing. Their, their faith is turned into action. They believe that God can and because they believe that God can, that prayer turns into, okay, let's put our shovels in. Let's, let's put our, uh, what, what does he call it here? Um, staves, verse 18. Let's put our staves in. That's what they have to dig with. Let's put our staves in and dig this, dig this well. God says it's here. And they begin to dig. And to dig. And to dig. And God sends up the bountiful supply. I'm drinking at the waters beneath the cloudless sky. <laughs> Beulah Land. I, uh, the reason why I believe that the first 16 verses are important because unless... 
unless we see that this singing comes out of a heart that's really been transformed and changed, we really might not get the meaning out of it. You might look down and you just might read through and say, oh yeah, uh, then, then Israel sang this song, spring up well, oh well, sing ye unto it. And you might miss the point. You might miss the point that they, they did it at the direction of Moses. You might miss the point of all the places where they're going from Matanah to Nahalio to, Bamath to, Bamath, uh, to, to, to Moab to the top of Pisgah where Moses will, give, will die on the top of that mountain when he sees the promised land. You might miss it when he says he's looking toward Jeshimon. You might miss it when he's dealing with the kings and the battles that are taking place. And even when they'll go through the king's highway and they tell, the, they tell Og the... the I mess up these kings. Sihon and Og, the king of, uh, was it, what are the kings of Amorites and Basia? So we don't need anything from you. We're just trying to pass on through. And they attack them from the rear. We might miss it, the importance of the song, if we didn't know the context of it. So I pray that this would be a help to you. I pray that this would be something that inspires um, hope, inspires faith, that these songs wouldn't be, just be anything. As it brings us to the point where we're singing because of God's faithfulness to us. We just believe that God can. Any comments? Feedback? Yes, sir. Mm. They said it gets them fired up for that and all. And I said, well, in our day, it was the national anthem. That's what got fired up before the baseball game. Right. Everybody in the stands got fired up for that. And, uh, you know, I just didn't understand it. Kind of we didn't even do any of that for the boys uh, or there. But as I started going on, I started to see just really a, a rally cry. Mm hmm. Yeah, it unifies them around God, and uh, you know you, you've you've never seen the whole nation of Israel so united, and it, you know not only with each other but around God Himself, and uh, you know it seemed like as they were traveling they they lacked that faith, but now that faith just brings them into harmony. They're working together, they're striving together, they they're praying together, they're singing together, and it's just this togetherness that I see out of there, and uh, yeah, yeah. Right on. Anybody else? All right. Well, that's uh, Brother Sheely. Would you close us out in a word of prayer?